don't feel any pressure. We'll just get into it naturally. No, there's no intro. I have to go to the restroom. You have to, okay, we'll go to the restroom now before we start. <laughs> God. Hey, want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? Sergeant Hugo Stiglitz. Heard up. Everybody. Hey, welcome back to Meanwhile at the Studio. I'm your host today, Nate. Uh, so yeah, today we've got John Patterson joining us, local Florida film legend, I would say, and uh, his son, some guy <laughs> that just showed up. No, John, John and Sean Patterson, welcome to the show. I appreciate you guys coming on to talk about the uh, the history of the studio some more. Yeah, thanks for having us. You're welcome. Yeah. So, uh, J- John, where you got started before you made the studio, you were in the film industry prior to, correct? Yes, I was. So where, how did you get started in the, in the film industry prior to building the studio? Prior to building the studio, I was started at, at Cypress Gardens. Okay. And uh, we did a lot of commercials and TV shows, and especially a lot of daytime television. But that goes back to black and white right. days. And that goes back to two inch versus a half inch and three, you know, three quarters and stuff. Right. So back in the day, you were working with uh, Dick Pope Sr., is that correct, at Cypress Gardens? Correct. Yeah. He would come in and say, hey, guys, we're going to do something for Ed Sullivan. And we got to come up with an idea of uh, what to do. And you guys were just left to it? We were left there with your mouth hanging open, figuring out what are we going to do? And the situation became very normal for Mr. Pope because, you know, he's the type of person who would carry on two or three different conversations in his office right? at the same time. So it was like, you do this, people. you do this, you do this. Right. And... No, well, no, no, he was carrying on just general conversations. Oh, okay. How he was able to keep them all separated, I don't know. I'd go crazy. But uh, he was noted for that. And he, at the same time, he'd be tearing little pieces of paper off of a tablet uh-huh. and then have it while he was talking. Is that just his little fidget that he would do? He had a little fidget, a little nervous thing, but I guess, but he did it all the time. You go in his office and there's little pieces of paper everywhere. That's a, he's a crazy man. It looked like a puncher. I'd done it, yeah. Oh, I got you. Yeah. So before, uh, before that, before you got involved in Cypress Gardens and Dick Pope, take us back to where, like, when did you decide, like, okay, I'm going to be a filmmaker? Like, how did you make that? Where did, where, what were you doing? And, you know, how did you come to that conclusion? I was in high school. Okay. Uh, and I started because of, uh, actually because of my cousin. My cousin had, he and his father had a Western Auto store in Kent, Ohio. And uh, he would come down and show the uh, slides of where they went on their summer vacation. Okay. Okay. So they had a lot of pictures, but all he thought, always usually was, well, in this picture, I forgot to do this, or I forgot to do that. Well, in this one, is kind of dark, so you have to use your imagination on it. And I thought, well, he spent more time explaining why the picture was bad or out of focus than it took to do it right. So I figured, well, that's got to be crazy. So I thought at the time, I can do that. I don't think I'll forget to do this and do that and do this. Right. But uh, that's how I got interested in how I got started. And then, of course, I did it for stills. And then I got interested in the movies. But the movies at the time were 8 millimeter. Okay. And 8 millimeter cost a lot more than a 35 millimeter slide. But uh, they were the next best thing to be in life, like, because they walked, they talked, they did all kinds of things. Right. So that's how I got interested in doing the movies. I wanted as close to real life as you could get. Nice. So what was your first camera that you that you bought? <laughs> An 8mm Keystone cassette camera. Because So it would use cassette, like a, almost a cassette tape to yes. record on? Yes, they came in a cassette and you just put it in the way it went. I mean, you had to, of course, stop and start it. But I mean, right. everything was self-contained. That's awesome. So then when did you get your, your first, like, film job? Well, I came down to Cypress Gardens with my mother and father, and uh, they asked where they, they asked, I asked, I'm sorry, where we were going for the summer vacation, and they said, well, we're going to go down to Cypress Gardens. And I thought, oh, Cypress Gardens, 
who wants to look at flowers. Right. Uh, but they said, now there's girls there. Well, then I get my idea. Now, now, now they my, got your attention again. Got my attention. So away we went. And I came down for that first time to Cypress Gardens. And we went in here. And I looked around and I saw them shooting pictures uh, at the time at Cypress Gardens on the big lawn mm-hmm. up front. <clears throat> so I got to talking with the PR guy who was at the time Al McFadden. And I asked him, I said, you know, how do you get started in this business or how could I get a job here? He said, would you like a job? I said, sure, I'd like one. But I'm in school yet. I'm still in high school. Okay, so you were like, what, 17 or 18 at the time? Uh, Yeah, I guess. That was my last year of high school, I think. So anyway, Uh, he said, well, come down. We'll introduce you to come in the office. We'll introduce you to Mr. Pope. And when you get out of school, let me know. And we have a job. Okay. So every year I would, or every six months, I would contact him just to keep that contact. Because right. at the time I wanted to do movies. I knew that when I was in high school. But at that time, you could not get into business unless your mother or father or a cousin or brother <clears throat> were already in the business. Right. You could not get in. It didn't make any difference where you went to school or what you did. Unless you knew someone you weren't Unless you knew door. someone. And so you got, I mean, that must have been a huge door to open when you were 17 or 18 to, you know, just run across Dick Pope. Right. I, I just, and it was a fluke. I didn't want to come to Cypress Gardens and look at a bunch of flowers. Well, my mother said, well, they got girls there too. That kind of changed my, you know. Changed your tune a little bit. Tune a bit, yeah. Came for the girls, stay for the film. Right. Gotcha. And then I stayed and filmed and followed them around all day long. And with my little eight millimeter camera. And uh, finally, I struck up a conversation with Al McFadden, who was the head of the public relations at the time. And he said, well, we'll introduce you to Mr. Pope. We have time because he's in Blowing Rock right now. So I will uh, keep you in mind and let you know and see what happens. So I kept in touch with him for a year. Okay. And then a year later, I came down here and Mr. Pope uh, interviewed me and said, uh, well, come down. What can you do? And I said, well, we'll give it a try. And he said, you know, we'll teach you how to do it. Well, so it was almost like a summer internship for you in, in a way. It was a summer intern without the intern being <laughs> <laughs> Right. You, you were all on your own. And uh, that's how I got started in the business. But because I was interested in it, I was able to exceed in the business very rapidly. Right. So uh, you did the summer when you were 18, 19. Uh, right. with, and then after that, what what was the, between then and opening Dolphin Image, or Dolphin, God, Dolphin Image, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Patterson Studios, what was, the, what was the journey between those two times? Well, at the time I worked at the gardens and I did all kinds of commercials because everybody would come to Cypress Gardens at the time to do anything that was on water. Because right. Because everybody in the New York area had trouble doing pictures on water because they couldn't get good uh, readings, the F-stops. Mm-hmm. It would either be burnout or dark or whatever. But mine were always right on the money, so they couldn't figure out what it was. But uh, it was in all in the light meter at the time. Okay, so you had a little secret weapon. Yeah, and how to work it. Right. Well, that's true. I'm sure that was available to everybody, but... Right. But uh, most people, uh, yeah, sunshine and... You Good know, to F-16 go. or F-11, whatever. But back then, the ASA of the film, which was the the way films were, your film was based upon, were to set your automatic dials at to get the right exposure. Uh, there was no uh, no set way of doing anything uh, like it is today. You just set it and forget it. Right. That's so, cool. Yeah. So you were uh, you were working. When you're in your 20s working with Dick Pope, what were you doing like feature film? Were you doing mostly commercial work? Like what kind of work were you doing? Started out with black and white with commercials. Mm-hmm. Uh, that only lasted less than six months. And uh, they came after me to do a uh, commercial. And I almost dropped my teeth. The commercial, what am I supposed to do? 
And uh, they said, well, here's the subject and here's what you got to do. So nobody was around to tell you how to do it or where to do it or anything. You were all on your own. Mm -hmm. So luckily I hit it right and did it. And that was the start of it. And then I just kept growing and growing and growing until the reputation got into New York with the ad agencies Mm -hmm. and everything. Uh, And then I started doing a lot of commercials and national commercials. Uh, All the automobiles at the time was General Motors and Ford. Those were the two major ones. Right. Uh, There was a Studebaker in there and some other stuff. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, there there were a lot of things like that. And from there, uh, Cypress Gardens, then I started shooting automobiles down in Sebring in the uh, Sebring 24 Hours of Sebring. Of course. And I rode around with a lot of the cars. Well, at that time, I could ride in the cars during the time trials. Uh Uh-huh. And no safety harnesses, no belts, no nothing. You just sit over the other side right. from the driver and hold on. And hope to God but you had to crash. hold your camera at the same time. So right. It was a little thrilling at the time. And the drivers, of course, would like to go around during the time trials and do the one-arm stuff or you know, uh, show off to the other drivers and uh, put the... <laughs> Put your hands out the window and everything else. Right. But uh, it was a, and of course, you're being slammed all over the inside of the car I'm because sure there was a, no safety belts. Did you, what were you restrained with? Was it just like a regular seat belt or anything? You, hand, <laughs> you held on to something inside the car. Oh, just the oh shit handle? Uh, not even that. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a belt. That's awesome. A very slim belt. Very slim belt. Yeah. Oh, man. So, after that, you're like 25, 26, and you're you're working in the, in the industry. So when did you o- you opened uh, Patterson Studios in '64? Uh, yeah, I believe so. According to history, <laughs> <laughs> according to history, because the mind doesn't stay up with the newspapers. <laughs> right, right. So uh, you start uh, first sh- uh, film was done, or first uh, set was in '64, but the actual uh, foundation or the building of it was probably I assume like '62, '63. I believe it was 1963. Okay. Uh, I actually dug the footer for the foundation here because no one in Florida knew, knew how to build a studio. But my good friends in, the, in uh, California were the head set designers for Universal Studios. Okay. And I contacted them, and they said, well, we'll send you the blueprints. So they sent me the blueprints to Universal Studios. But I was able to get what I needed and so told the people here building the studio. Right. What I needed, I didn't need to go those gigantic stages and everything. Right. So this, I mean, we legitimately have a Hollywood studio here in Winter Haven. Yes, you do. Yeah. Unofficially. Unofficially, yes, you do. It's a small studio, but it's better than 90% of the ones in California today. Definitely. I mean, it's built, you can uh, probably withstand a nuclear holocaust in here. That's what most <laughs> of the guys were built to say, said, we know where to go if anything happens. <laughs> yeah, same here. If there's a, you know, when we're working, if there's a hurricane coming in, we're like, all right, well, we if everything here. goes to hell, we'll right. meet up here. Right. right. So what made you think, like, oh, I could definitely open a studio because at the time, you know, there was, it's not like there, this was like film country at the time. This was a cow pasture when I started it. And at the same time, there was a lot of uh, cactus out here. So I gave each one of my boys... 25 cents or 15 cents, I don't know, for a bucket of, it started out at 20 to 50 cents or something, a bucket. A bucket of cacti? Yeah. 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 Well, they started coming back with a lot of buckets, and I thought, gee, this is, I priced this too high. (laughs) Right. So so I knocked that price down in a hurry. Per day. It makes me 15 cents. (laughs) He said per day, then. (laughs) Per day, not per bucket. (laughs) I bet you were working fast for that 50 cent a bucket. (laughs) Yeah. But anyway, we got rid of all the cactus for a while. But uh, one, one, one needs to get rid of some of the cactus now. I see them coming back. I see it too. I was about to say, <laughs> not for long, because I've I've been back out there and uh, definitely kicked a few. Yeah, yeah, and they hurt. <laughs> Absolutely. So you, uh, who, who would you like? Were you partners with anybody in building the studio? Like, did you team up, or was it just kind of your own thing, and you brought people in as needed? It was my own idea. There were no people around here that really knew a whole, whole lot about the industry. Right. So you had to teach them. 
And for the most part, I was self-taught all the way through. And you learn by making a good decision or a bad one. Right. And hopefully uh, making more good ones than bad ones. Thank God for that. Right. Yes. Uh, I made uh, good decisions, and I hopefully I think I made the right ones. So. Well, I think I, so. I'd have to agree because if you didn't make those good decisions, we wouldn't be here today. So you know, we, th- we <laughs> thank right. you for all those good right. decisions. But what was there? Was there a certain time that you said, "I need to build a, a complex down the street"? Because Cypress Gardens didn't provide it, or you just wanted to go on your own. Yeah, like, like what made you production? think I need to open my own studio, not right. rely on other people? Well, as you could see, everything I was doing at Cypress Gardens and what happened at the time when we had the older cameras, when you tried to shoot anything on the water, the cameras wouldn't do it because they reflected the water, reflected and knocked their their meters all to get all wrong mm-hmm. or the cameras would not open up. They didn't have all the automatic advancements that they had, that they have now. So they, uh, I got a reputation <clears throat> for shooting pictures on the water. So anything that had to do with water, they would send down to me to bid on. And then I started getting in with all the big ad agencies in New York. Okay. And I started getting in with all of the big products in New York which we have here, of course, all the General Mills breakfast cereals. Uh, I can go on and on and on about all the products. Yeah, I saw Paps Blue Ribbon. Uh, I know you've done Sunny's. A lot of Paps Blue Ribbon we did. Uh, that was my, my drink of choice in college, so shout out to uh, <laughs> Paps Blue Ribbon. Paps Blue Ribbon, yeah. Uh, there was about four or five of them, beer commercials we did. And I can't remember the names right now. Oh, that's okay. I was going to ask if you had any favorites, There's, but if you don't remember their names, I guess it doesn't do I any good. I did fa- Falstaff Beer. Okay. Jack's. Pass through Ruin. Jack's. Jack's Beer out of New Bud, Orleans, which Bud, was a local beer. Yeah, Budweiser. Uh, and I'm trying to think of their, their uh, premium quality beer that they had. It was, a, it was a, made by Jack's, but it was a, had a different name at the time. It's like a high, right. higher quality I guess, yeah. higher price anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, cool. Um, yeah, what did, you know, you were doing all these commercials, and then so I think what Sean and I were getting to was like, what what was the need to make the studio? Like, what did you, why, what was the need that they didn't have? Was it just space or controlling, you know, your set better or what? Well, you have, to conf- you have to go back to when I started. There was nobody here to help that knew anything about the motion picture business to speak of. Right. Uh, So I had to teach them, or I would find out what to do. At the time, I read everything I could read on motion pictures, Mm -hmm. and the best magazine at the time was Cinematographer. And I learned everything page by page by page. I read all all the ads, all of the stories, and everything. So there's where I got my start being self-taught. Gotcha. And then Mr. Pope at the time, uh, I guess had the idea that I knew pretty much what I was doing. So he hired a guy by the name of Andre Delavar, who did a lot of short subject films for 20th Century Fox, I think at the time. And he had him come over here and teach me everything that he knew. Okay. Now Andre Delavar was a person who knew the whole industry. He knew what to shoot, how to shoot when to edit and how to edit and so on and so forth, which he taught me. And thank God I learned real very quickly. And uh, So you just took all that knowledge and said, okay, I'm going to put it all into the the building the studio. Yeah, because at the time there wasn't any facility here in Central Florida, nothing. Well, I think this was the first soundstage in Central Florida built. Is that correct? Yes, it is. First in Florida or just first in, in in the area? It was, I don't know if it would be the first studio. I could say yes, it was the first studio. Let's just say yes. Just to do motion picture work in the movie business. Built It was a building built for motion pictures. Right, not a commercial studio. For no, it wasn't a commercial. converted Highline Fronton. It wasn't a converted, you know, anything indoors. I think right? it was the first purpose-built studio in Florida. Right. Mm-hmm. And all the soundproofing was brought in from California. Right. Uh, everything. And that's what I was going to ask you about because, I mean, there was no industry here already, so it's not like you can just I go think, down to Walmart and, you know, buy your right. uh, your equipment. How did you 
how did you import all that equipment at the time? I mean, there was no Amazon. There's no, you know, searching for it on the internet. Well, I had a lot of good friends in Universal Studios. Uh, and uh, they said, whatever you need, let me know. We'll do it. So I said, okay. Uh, I need plans for a soundstage so I can tell people what I need, contractors or builders. Here. Right. <clears throat> so they said, okay. They sent me blueprints. It was blueprints for the whole Universal Studios. And I thought, what am I going to do with this? I need a what? Just like a quarter of this. <laughs> yeah. One building. Right. <laughs> so anyway, that's how I got started in that. And then I got the local builders. Uh, and I'm sure those contractors freaked out when you're like, okay, I, this is what I want. <laughs> and then they see, you know, these blueprints. This well, crazy. I went to the, so the, the uh, block company in town, was, was superior block company at the time. And I said, I need some concrete blocks, but I need bigger than eight inch blocks so I can at least fill the walls with sand or get the soundproofing in it. Right. So they said, okay, well, we'll mill we got some 12 inch blocks, actually 12 inches wide. And that's what the stage is built out of. Everything is 12 inches, yeah. not eight inch block. No, it is rock solid. It's, it's this place rock is... solid. And it was very silent. Right. So like, uh, all you had to do is fill up the pores with sand and everything, and it was really solid. So the all the uh, all the holes are filled with sand. Yeah, that's. I, I just assumed it was poured concrete, so that's cool. No, the concrete goes with the lentils that go around at eight foot levels. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, take a sip of water, man. We're just hanging out. So I guess all the cells were filled with sand, and then your every eight feet was a uh, was con concrete. You know, lentils, and then they start over again right to that so. yeah. and we still got the same uh soundproofing in the sound stage today that you that you put up we just painted it black yeah so that stuff was built to last yeah i never painted it black i kept it white uh, but afterwards you know they get stained and everything right so uh, painting it black is a good idea yeah keep it keep it fresh <laughs> we we had uh replaced the soundproofing in here uh because of all the signatures and uh and I think a little bit of cigarette smoke from back in the day. Oh, Just a little, a little bit. bit yeah. <laughs> it started out as white and ended up as yellow. Yeah. <laughs> I was, it's, a, it's a nice calming vanilla, a warm vanilla. <laughs> yeah, vanilla. <laughs> Does not smell like vanilla, but oh. could you imagine? These wall, if these walls could talk, right? Oh, man. That would be crazy. <laughs> what was it? A lot of Speak, stories. Speaking of crazy, what's the, uh, I mean, was there, when you were coming up before you built the studio, uh, did you do any off the wall or kind of crazy shoots that uh that you can remember was there anything inside my gardens yeah yeah a lot of them were because mr pope would be the kind of person who would come to you and say look we need to do a show uh we said sullivan he would say ed called and we need to do a show for him he's going to give us 30 seconds and i said okay what do you want to do and he would say i don't know think of something and he says, and I'll think of something. Uh, we got to come up with something. And so we started out to do something. <laughs> and uh, something turned into be an idea. And from there, it grew into another idea and another idea. And gradually, we had the original story that we were going to do. And uh, then it was my job to go out and do it. Shoot it, direct it, get the kids to do things and the water skis and everything. Right. And you had to show the water skis <clears throat> because they had the decals of Cypress Gardens. And, uh, and that was uh, Dick Pope's whole thing is as long as you were advertising for Cypress Gardens, you guys pretty much had the run of the place, right? Right. As long as you advertised for beautiful Cypress Gardens. Be that was the t you had to say beautiful, beautiful Cypress Gardens. Cypress Gardens. And he would, and did you have access to pretty much? the entirety of like all of their boats and skiers and anything you wanted to do out there. Right. That's awesome. Cause I had certain dates that I had to have these shows done mm -hmm. because they were going on network television. Right. And in doing that, I had to have certain things by a certain time or we'd miss the air dates. Right. So at that time, you know, he was getting free time uh, for doing the shows. And then later on, he had all these people coming down, too, uh, which he would say won't cost you anything as long as you mention Cypress Gardens. Right, that was always a catch. say beautiful Cypress Gardens. Right. 
that's how things got started. And did uh, were the skiers and the performers were they excited to work with you guys? Were they like, oh shit, there's a uh, this is a, a you know a Patterson set. We've got a <laughs> he's gonna have us out here for twelve hours doing the same thing, or you know how well, did that yeah, go? Yeah, to a certain degree, they. <laughs> When it was cold weather, yeah, the skiers said, oh, my God, we got to go out and then freeze. Right, and not look like we're freezing. Right. Smile. Right. Don't chatter. Yeah. And that was kind of cruel in a way, but it was fun. For thank you. God. Thank God they were young and could take it. Right. That's awesome. That's awesome. Did you guys, I mean, I've seen the pictures, you know, from the book, and you, you've had, you know, these buy and try level you know, rigs set up on the boats and you know, crazy, you know, doing these crazy angles. Like, how was that? Whose idea was that to say, hey, let's put three stories on top of this boat and film on the water? That would, that was pretty much my idea as far as putting it on the barge and going around. Right. No uh, concern for safety. Just, you're like, yeah, this should work. This should hang be on. Right. So you stay up there loose as a goose and you would do a dance as the little waves would come by and hit the boat. Right, because it's not and just you, like a road. You're on, you're in the open water. You're in open water, and you have no control over the other boats that pass you by. Right, so you're catching their wake in there. Because this was uh, right. Lake Elbert, right? Is what Lake you Eloise. Were, Lake Eloise, yeah. sorry. Yep, and uh, Lake Summit, mostly Lake Eloise because it was a larger lake. Right. If the wind was blowing out of the east or out of the west or whatever, you could always go to the other side of the lake and have calm water. Oh, okay. Because it, uh, you could not use those big high parallels. When I got up to eight sections, I get to be pretty much. Eight sections you would go up? I think seven or eight. On a boat? Like on a moving boat, not just a... On a, uh, on a barge. Jesus. Yeah. On a pontoon boat, really. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's that's not safer. <laughs> yeah, but you also did like there's um, you know, boats going through fire, and they, would, they always, always have to a, come up with different things to do with boats and skiers like <laughs> we, kite flyers and fire you're always trying to up the ante right like every time we had to go trying to come up with a new idea right like for every holiday we would have santa claus arrives at cypress gardens by kite or santa claus arrives by boat uh, anything idea that you could come up with to advertise the products right that were at cypress garden did they ever do a santa comes by parachute yeah they did okay did you film that one too uh, I'm, yes, we did. That was way back when. Yeah, one of the first ones. <clears throat> right. The parasail. Oh, the parasail with a fan on the back and... Right. Well, just without pull the... Pulling behind. You pull it behind oh, the, the boat. Oh, the parasail was, a, okay, yeah. behind the boat. Yeah. Everything was behind the boat. Sort of like a, right. sort of like a kite. So... <laughs> anyway, they followed the boat. <laughs> <laughs> did anybody, you ever see anybody, uh, you know, get hurt or... Uh, you know, any, any of your uh, crazy inventions go awry out there? It's it's past the, uh, you know, it's too long. They can't see you. Don't worry. I thought a couple of them came very close. The one was when we were doing a uh, thing with what we called the flivers. Mm-hmm. They were just small buck, like teacup uh, boats. Were those the really small ones that were super fast? They had a huge engine on them. Right. Yeah. yeah. And everybody died on those. And the front of them were pretty big bow. Yeah. yeah. Rounded yeah, like. but the, the only problem with those boats was that you didn't think about until it happened. Uh, we were going down to the islands, of the gardens. At the same time, we were trying to show Cypress Gardens and, and the beauty of the flowers and right. design and the yards and the islands and everything. And what happened is we had one team with the big medicine ball, which was a, like six feet wide by six feet high, of course circular at the time. And one team was supposed to hit the ball with the out with the fliver and run it through a net. And you had the other team coming from the other side. Okay. The thing is we didn't remember or didn't think about was when these boats were coming at each other and then you had that big six foot ball in the middle of them. Right. In between them, they couldn't see each other. So when they're both trying to hit the ball. They're both coming. Head on. (laughs) And so what happened? Yeah, they came head on. One flivver went over top of the other one, and I saw the prop just going and going right by the person's head that was sitting down in the flivver. That scared everybody. I could imagine. So we said, we'll do it one more time. (laughs) (laughs) Of course, you got to get the shot, man. Make sure you deck this time. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And that used to be the saying with the movies anyway, one more time. 
Yep. One more time. Nobody yeah. died? One more time. Yeah, nobody got hurt. That's good. Thank God. Yep. So fa- uh, fast forwarding from there to like 1964, that's the first, That's the opening of Patterson Studios. Right. And uh, your first commercial shot on the soundstage was? This is the first studio. I mean, uh, McDonald's. McDonald's, right? McDonald's hamburgers. Yeah. Out of Chicago. And you weren't here for that? I was not here. You were I was up. in, I believe I was in Wyoming doing a picture for Paramount. You in Wyoming, that I somehow do not doubt that. You're always <laughs> out there. Yeah, I don't know if I was there now. I have my own home there and a home here. Nice. And that's where you filmed uh, The Legend of El Durand, right? It was out there. Yeah, the El Durand, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. You're fine. Uh, what was I Let me take, take a sip. Me. Take a sip. We're not on. We'll cut this part out. Or not. It's a podcast. Yeah. I shouldn't have had that soon. <laughs> <laughs> So that was, so 1964 is when you were opening the studio. Yeah, 1964. And then you're saying you were out in Wyoming. So that's probably when your first trip to Wyoming that you fell in love with Wyoming as well? That was the beginning of, uh, yeah, Yeah. the rest of my life, yeah. The beginning of the love affair of Wyoming? It was, because I I always liked animals, and when I would go travel out there, of course, the antelope were everywhere. Right. And I kept wondering what they were, and they told me they were antelope. But uh, the deer were there, the elk were there, all the wild animals were there, the geese, the ducks, everything. Well, so to me, it was like being in a zoo. Right. And that's what I noticed when I was doing you know, some research on you and you know, seeing some of the, the stuff you worked on. It was a lot of nature. I saw a lot of nature. A lot of nature. A lot of nature stuff, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of outdoors, a lot of animals, so, mm-hmm. and everything looked beautiful. So I think that's... Uh, and. Uh, watching that film where it was, you know, giving you the award from Florida, uh, that was a lot of what everyone was talking about was what you were known for is just how, like, beautiful the shots were and getting shots where other people would not be able to get such a nice result with film. Right. It was a... I don't know. It was a natural feeling for me to do it and to shoot it, and I knew how to shoot a lot of the dark... At that time, you know, we had a a film, if you know anything about film... It has a certain rating, mm-hmm. an ASA as we call it. Uh, at that time I started, it was ASA 10 or 12. And what did that, because I'm from the generation that has no idea what that stands for. So could, if you could break that down for like, what does that, that stand was a, for? That was a, the film was a sensitive to light. Mm-hmm. And they had to start with a zero time some, I mean, somewhere to give a d- description of your film how sensitive it would be to light. Okay. So if you had it set for the wrong sensitivity, then it would either come out dark or it would come out light. So you had no way to control that. Gotcha. So they came out with the ASAs. And the ASAs were the rating for what it was set for. At that time that I started, it was ASA 10. Uh, Now they're up into the hundreds. Okay. Thousands right now. You can probably shoot in a dark room and get a reading. For sure. Yeah. For sure. So it's come a long way. That's for sure. Um, at that time, when you had pictures that you were doing on water, any little reflection on the water would bounce up and throw all the light meters crazy. Okay. So there were not too many people that knew how to take good ra- good readings on the water. But they knew that if they came to Cypress Gardens, they knew that I could go ahead and give them a good picture. Right. So that's where you were bringing, after you opened the studio, you were bringing a lot of that New York uh, ad agency work, a lot of California work. To the studio. To the studio. They followed me. Uh, At the time, it was great. You know, when I first started the studio, I asked Mr. Pope if he would be interested in going in business with me. And he said, no, thank you. Uh, not a, you know, he was apologized and everything, but he said, I really know the gardens and that's where I want to stay. Gotcha. And I said, great. So he did that and I did mine. So, but he would help me out any way he could, but you know, he would pick up the phone and talk to Ed Sullivan at the time. 
on a weekly basis practically on doing come up with ideas and things like that. Right. Or he would call the major studios in California uh, when we did like Esther Williams Spectacular. That was the last show that I shot uh, while I was working at uh, Cypress. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was working at Cypress Gardens at the time. And we did the Esther Williams Spectacular with Esther Williams and Fernando Lamas. Uh, we built the, Mr. Pope built the Akarama swimming pool right. at the time for doing all the underwater stuff. Right, and if anyone doesn't know what that was, uh, Sean, tell, uh, you told me a little bit about it last time. But what, what was the Aquarama, Aquarama swimming pool? I can't talk. That, that was the you know, huge, well, we, we were little, but it was really huge, uh, Olympic-sized pool. Mm -hmm. And it also had windows underneath. Right. So you could shoot underwater. And it was deep enough where you could have, you know, a 10-foot coral and people scuba diving in it. You could have boats in it. You could have skiers. We They would have a winch on one side of the pool, and they would pull skiers across the pool. Oh, okay. So you could have, with no boat, you could just yeah. have a shot of yeah. somebody skiing. Yeah. So that they could shoot, uh, like, high speed of how they jumped in the water, like a uh, shallow water start. Uh -huh. So you could really shoot high speed of how the barefooter jumps in the water or how a prop spins. So you could shoot that from underwater. So if Johnson or Evan Rude wanted to shoot their props, right? You know, they could go underneath and shoot it. And they didn't have to have scuba tanks and, and be underwater for certain. They had windows, and they could do a lot of that. That's really cool. So they would light it from the inside, underwater, but inside. To get front light, of right. course. Because, you know, you still had ambient light from the sun. But, you know, there was still a lot of that stuff, too. Yeah, at the same time, you know, we did a thing with shooting on the water. Um, we had full control of it. You didn't have to worry about waves or other boats or anything like that. You could all do it right there. Gotcha. In the pool. So that's the main advantage that we had was all that control. Right. Uh, so it worked out great. That's awesome. So from 1964, you're starting there, and you've had, what, th at least 30 or almost 40 years of open having Patterson Studios opened. Was there any jobs that came through the door that you turned down? No. No. I don't know of any. You don't know of any? That's cool. If there was, I... Uh, I just, so you were just like, whatever, if you've got the money, we can do it. They would call me and say, okay. Uh, I remember we did the Anita Bryant Citrus commercials. And that was a very big challenge at the time because they wanted to show a spigot going into an orange. Mm -hmm. You opened the spigot up and it filled up a giant glass, which we had to build special. Uh, and the glass held 64, 66 gallons of orange juice. Jeez. Now, we only were dealing with 60 seconds. So you had to have the spigot look like it was capable of doing this in 60 seconds, okay. filling that up. So it had to shoot so it out So it had quick. to be a big spigot. Right. So we had to get a big orange. And Anita Bryant you know, takes a spigot and jams it into the orange and turns it on. And there goes the juice into the glass. We had three glasses made over in uh, Tampa at the uh, plastics place. And they said, we don't know if this will work. We're not going to guarantee it. Right. But uh, I had three of them built, uh, allowing for the fact that maybe one of them would break. Right, of course. So the people in New York said, are you going to be able to build a glass? And they showed me the glass that they wanted built. And we still have that glass, and it's still being used today. The glass, I mean, the real glass. Right. We used as a model. And uh, I put that up to the plastics guys. They built a mock-up mold out of wood, mm -hmm. uh, heated it up, made the glass. We made three of them. And I had to test it with the clients from New York, which was at that time Lennon and Newell, who was the agency. <clears throat> we filled the one glass. We started to fill it. It was creaking and cracking. And, <laughs> and it finally, it just went and, and went all over the stage. And that 64 gallons of orange juice? Well, we didn't get the 64. It broke before we got that full. <laughs> and, of course, everybody's heart dropped. Oh, my God. I would have been And so the pissed. people from the agency said, my God, this is not going to work. Right. So I said, well, we got to back up. So we used another glass 
the next day after we mopped down the whole studio. How long did that take to clean up? It took a while because it was real orange juice. Yeah. We had all the sticky stuff. And everybody right. pick up their feet and we go. Everybody walking through the uh, the office and everything just yeah, sticky everywhere. Everywhere. So we built the second one. I mean, we had already built. But we put the second one in. And we filled it with orange juice. And everybody's standing there with an open mouth, uh, kind of watching and listening. And all of a sudden. Oh, no. And then poof, it broke. Jeez. That was the second one. Did you get any more or was it just? Uh, I had one more built. Okay. Because you couldn't build these overnight. Right. These they are were custom made. Yeah. Plastic. So I said, that's enough. It'll work. And the people at the agency says, how do you know it'll work? It just broke two of them out of the three. Right. I said, it'll work. And it, honest to God, did work. It held the juice. And... Uh, they went on to use that glass, the fake glass, in a lot of road shows that they did. But it finally, after about eight or nine months, it finally broke. Yeah. But uh, I didn't care. I wasn't doing the commercial. <laughs> Off of your hands, right? <laughs> what, did you guys have like a tanker of orange juice parked out front in the, uh, the had, parking lot? We had two 55-gallon drums stashed up in the tree because this was an orange that was on a tree. Okay. And Anita comes in with the spigot, jams it into the orange, opens the spigot up, and it has to look like it's filling these big glass, which was sixty some gallons. So it was the 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 big glass was it was it underneath the tree, and so it would drain from the tree into the big glass. Right. Okay, gotcha. The, tr- the orange was on a tree. Right. And she jams that into the orange, turns the spigot on, which is on the tree. Right. And all this juice comes out. Now, it had to look like you could possibly fill that glass, a giant glass. All the way up. In, in the 60 thing. seconds. Right. It's a ton. And uh, we fudged a little, but, I mean, we filled that glass up. And that glass that they had made it, the big plastic one, just hung in there and hung in there and hung in there. Just long enough. And everybody was so relieved that it did. Right. I'm sure the uh, the cleaning crew was the most relieved that they didn't have to clean up another, you know, 40 <laughs> gallons of uh, orange juice that day. Well, you're talking to one of the cleaning crew. Oh, okay. Two of us. Two right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because oh. everybody did multitask things. Of course. That's how it is here. Yeah. That's, it's, mm-hmm. and nothing's changed. Nope. So, everybody <laughs> do a little bit of everything. Um, I wanted to talk to you. I saw in one of the um, one of the videos I was watching of your old projects, it was something called The Spring or The Springs. Oh, the feature film? Yeah, the feature film, The Springs. What was your involvement in that? And it was, uh, from what I saw, it looked like a, maybe like a horror movie or some kind of like thriller of... Uh... It was a thriller, yeah. Basically, I don't know if I'd call it a horror film. But, yeah, it was The Spring. And Sean, what all did we do on that? You were still working on that one. Yeah. Oh, uh, we... We're doing a feature, and it was uh, all on location, and it was basically re- rediscovering the fountain of youth that Ponce de Leon Gotcha. Had. Okay. And then uh, somebody found it. Some scientist found it. Of course. And then, of course, you know, once this one finds it, another team finds it, now we're trying to fight to see who has control of the spring. Gotcha. So that's basically what it was about. Okay. So that was one of the movies we made uh, back in the... I think mid eighties, late eighties. Yeah, look, it had a, a real eighties vibe to it. Was that right. filmed here? Where did you guys do uh, that? It was filmed right here. So, some was filmed here, but the, all, all the locations. Oh, were, was on, yeah, all uh, around the state of Florida. All right. around, like more, mostly north, north uh, Florida, okay. Lake City, well, the Tallahassee. Are, it was where the caves are at. Right, and we shot the um, the big cave they made and uh, did the setup at Universal Studios here in Orlando. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I saw that. It was kind of like a shrine or like a, some kind of... Like a tip of doom. <laughs> that was yeah, that's thing, what I... Sort of like underground a, cave. I think it was the first feature to be shot at Universal. I think so, too. Ours. I think it was the first feature shot there. Yeah. That was awesome. How did you get involved with, with that? Did they just bring you in to do like the uh, be the DP for that film? Like, How did you guys the, get involved? Was, it was, it was your my action. film. Oh, it was your film? Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, I rented Universal Studios for that particular yeah. shot. That's awesome. Yeah, because yeah. they our my studio at the time wasn't big enough. We had to have a cave that the kids were in. I mean, the people were in it. It was Mary Crosby and I don't know who else but now. But uh, we had to have all these underground caves 
we shot some of them up in Tallahassee or north of Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. And we used several different caves in Florida. And then to do the big scenes, uh, we used, we built a mock-up of an underground cave in Universal Studios. And we used what we called gunite, which was a, a way of making it look like old rock mm -hmm. and like it was carved out of stone. And uh, that's how that got started. That's awesome. Yeah, I saw that. I was like, that, I didn't even know that. The only one uh, feature that I knew that you did was The Legend of Earl Rand. Uh, so I didn't know that you did. How many features have you done total? A half a dozen. Half a dozen? Wow. What uh, What was your favorite? Was Earl Durand your favorite to work on, or did you have one that was like that stands out as like your, your masterpiece of all of them? Well, Earl Durand was my favorite of all because uh, it was outside. It dealt with animals. It was based on a true story that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and the guy that was in the Earl Duran was uh, Peter Haskell. Mm -hmm. He started out with Michael Parks first, and then Michael Parks got into, I don't know what he got into, but he became a different person. Gotcha. And uh, we had to let him go. And at the time, my stu my attorneys were in California at Loeb and Loeb, and uh, they said, you can't fire him. I said, why can't I fire him? He's not doing it. He's doing all these crazy stunts. And they said, no, you have to get him refusing how to do something because you as a director have to show him and tell him exactly what to do. Gotcha. So uh, I rigged a setup one night, and uh, we got him refusing directly uh, to do what I wanted him to do. So I said to everybody, okay, that's a wrap, cut. And uh, I couldn't talk to him. I couldn't do anything right. to Michael Parks. He said, you can't fire him directly. You have to fire him through the agency, which was William Morris at the time. Gotcha. And that's how that got started. And that was out in Wyoming. So by the time you do it in Wyoming, and then you had to drive to town, which is where the nearest phone was. Okay. You know, because you're out in the middle of nowhere, you know, Continental Divide, Wyoming. Right. So by the time you did it, then, you know, Dad had to go to town, make a phone call, phone call to, you know. Just to go to the make a phone call was a 50-mile trip. Jeez. Right. In those days. And then, you know, then I guess you had to call your attorney. Yep. And then and his. Of course, there was a time change for the L.A. time. Right. So it was a quite complicated <laughs> thing to do. So how, did how long did it take to fire him? Like a couple days before it was uh, all said and by the time you made the decision to who who laid down the orders that he was fired, the, his agency. Well, yeah, his agency guys, which was William Morris. Maybe I shouldn't say that. No, you're fine. <laughs> no, but how? So, like, how? Like, how? How did you? How did you deliver the news to him that he was that he was fired? That was delivered by the attorneys. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So you you uh. Wiped your hands of it, didn't do any of the dirty work. Right. Yes. Uh, you had to. It's a shame because uh, Michael Parks was a good actor. Yeah. And he's coming up. And were you working on that film or were you too young for that? I was too young. How old were you, like 10 when that came out? I was eight. Eight? Okay. I say I was eight. Because I was wanting to know if uh, how Sean was working on a set, how, you know, <laughs> how. Then I was probably a troublemaker. <laughs> 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 My brothers were in it. My, you know, Johnny and Greg were in it. They had parts in it. Okay. Um, yeah, Johnny, my oldest brother, he had speaking parts, and he was there with Martin Sheen. Martin Sheen. That, yeah. He must have been young, young Martin Sheen. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it was. I think it was one of uh, Martin's first features. I think. No, I don't think so. No. Um, okay. Could be. It was pretty close. Yeah. And uh, then, uh, yeah, Johnny was in there, and then Greg was in there as young Earl Duran, and then I was just. Uh, one of the family one members. Of little kids. Yeah. Yeah, one of the little kids. Little house I'm, on the prairie, little guys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. So those are, uh, those are some of the things that happened during that that most people don't know about. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I saw some of the BTS of that, of you guys making it and just, you know, hauling those giant cameras up the side of a mountain. Right. You know, 50 times. I'm sure your crew loved you for that. Oh, Yeah. They named a yeah. mountain. They named a mountain after him. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, <laughs> Patterson Mountain. <laughs> oh God, we're going up that yeah. mountain again. <laughs> yeah, they were fun to do at the time. 
we were young and didn't know better, we did it. And uh, everybody was still everybody on the crew or like family. Yeah. Today. You guys are still stayed close and tight? Yeah, except for all those who passed over. Well, sure. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's been a great career. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, you've, you've done a ton, a ton of work and I'm sure you've worked with a lot of, you know, really awesome people, really interesting yes. folks, not just, you know, actors famous, you know, uh, in front of the camera, but all the guys yeah, on, the, on the crew. I'm sure yeah. that's where you made the most friends. I, I would imagine. Both. I would say it was a 50, 50 deal. Yeah. But it, it was a uh, great. And how was Sean? I would like to know how Sean was working. You know, how was his work work ethic growing up here at the studio? Was he a uh, you know was he was he a hard worker? Did you have to you know crack the whip? How did uh, you know how how was it bringing up a son in in a movie studio? It was just like any other thing, I would say. Yeah. The most the kids were great, and they all did a good job. They're all in the business today, except for my oldest boy who passed away, but um, they have done very, very well for themselves. But uh, they're, I mean, they're still with it. Yeah. They're, they're a little <laughs> bit older than what they were when they started. <laughs> Did you ever throw any parties out here when you were young? I mean, you had this, you know, great facility growing up as a youth and, you know, you were, you weren't always here to, to monitor things like how you, know, you guys ever get, you guys ever get wild out here? Yeah, we did a couple parties. Couple, when, just when he didn't know, because we had, you know, we had keys. Of course, we had keys to the studio just in case, like something had to be done over the weekend. Right, while you he just was had to location. check up on the place on the weekend, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we had parties in the back, out in the woods, and we had parties in the stage. And of course, everybody was like, "Oh, we're in a movie studio." You yeah, know? I'm sure you were the cool guy on campus. So yeah, we had some good times. Thankfully, nobody got hurt. No one got hurt. No one, you know. yeah. nobody ever knew. No harm, no foul. Yeah, that's it's, right. It's a different time. It's a different time back <laughs> yes, then. Yes. Back then, it's like, you know, you drink and drive back then. Not that it happened to me, but, you know, the officer would just say, who are your parents? Okay, we're going to call them. They're going to come get you. Right. And you go home. Did you go, I, the John Patterson, no, that's my dad. No, it wasn't even that. It was just, you know, back in the 60s and 70s. You know, even when you got pulled over for drinking and driving, they just, okay, who are your parents? Let's call them. Right, right, They have to come get you. So it was more of embarrassment. Right. And today- I'd rather get arrested than deal with my parents, for sure. Yeah, well, I'd rather. (laughs) Still, (laughs) you know, I still get the, you know, the whipping and all that, but, you know, it's a lot better than jail time and the record for the rest of your life. For sure. No, 100%, 100%. (laughs) But yeah, back then it was like, you know, know, just hit your hand, you know, bad boy. Right. Have your dad or mom come get you, and then that was it. Now today, you know, like my boys, I mean, they wouldn't stand a chance. You'd be in jail. Oh, I'm sure the, some of the stuff that you guys pulled off out here back in the day, if uh, you guys would have had TikTok or Instagram, would have been in big trouble. <laughs> well, man, I appreciate you, John, for coming out and uh, just telling us a little bit of your story. I think we want to have you back on again one more time because I feel like there's a lot that we uh, kind of brushed over, maybe get into more of the details about some of the uh, stuff going on in sure. Earl Duran. But uh, until next time, we'll uh, we'll catch you later. No problem, and thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks.